Welcome to Hillcrest. We are glad that you are taking the opportunity to view our latest video sermon. Our pastors are proud to offer another way for you to join with the church family in worship each Sunday. Please remember that live services are held at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday at Hillcrest on the corner of Halleck and Newland in Jamestown, New York. Now please enjoy today's sermon. Let me share a little bit from my heart. As your pastors, we really covet your prayers. And I want you to make a special effort to pray for us, would you? There's lots of temptations, a lot of things that come our way, and we're regularly facing kind of challenges. So we would covet that opportunity for you to pray for us. And I want to issue just a little bit of a challenge. Um, perhaps you would take those first 15 minutes in the morning. You know when you're getting up and you're beginning to assess the day, you know, what's the temperature, what's it look like outside, those kinds of things, and just say a prayer, not only for your family, but would you just sneak Pastor Mark and Pastor Dan and myself in as well? We want to be the best pastors that we possibly can, and we take seriously what it says in Ephesians 4, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for the works of service. And we can always use your prayer as we do that. And we take our responsibility seriously. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy double honor. And we want, that's our heart's desire, to direct the affairs of the church well, especially those who preach and teach. And we're always mindful of James 3, 1 that says this, not many of you should be presumed to be teachers my brothers, because you know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, I don't see that as a threat. I see that as an opportunity to really dig in, an opportunity to really share with you and take that seriously. So as your pastors, we just would encourage you and ask you to pray for us regularly. So you're in Luke chapter 11, I hope, right now. We're actually going to take a look at the whole chapter, skim over some parts of it, and then focus in on the latter half of that. But According to some of uh, my close friends, I have officially entered, you know what it is? Geezerhood. Geezerhood. I turned 65 a couple of weeks ago, and, I, and I, read a, I came across a statement that said, and this says it just really well about geezerhood, I finally got my head together and my body fell apart. <laughs> Amen? Some of you probably can feel that. Now, part of that is your memory kind of goes. And uh, so I love to take tests just to see how my memory is doing. And that's why I love tests, because it gives me some feedback. And I need that kind of feedback from time to time. Um, tests show me where I need to do some work. Tests encourage me. How many of you get encouraged by taking a test? All the teenagers in this row, you just raised your hand, right? <laughs> sure you did. Sure you did. Um, uh, you know, one of my, my favorite was to take math tests. How many of you here look forward to math tests when you were in high school and in college? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah I, Wayne, I believe that. But I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified by English tests. You know, all, all that stuff, adversative conjunctions, connective conjunctions, adverbs, adverbs, all that stuff terrified me. And I have to uh, let you know that if my uh, 12th grade English teacher were alive today, he would say... It's a miracle that you write for a living. <laughs> I wasn't very good at that in that day. Loved math because things were black and white and you could figure out what the right answer was. But, you know, we all take tests. Even if you don't take a, a formal test, you take a, a, an informal test every day. Somebody is evaluating how you do at your job. It's true. It just is. You might get, get that official evaluation I, I, I take an evaluation every Wednesday night. Test. These guys all know it. I ask them, what did they learn? What did they like? What's going on in their life? And I, I want to make sure that what I set out to teach them actually reached them. I want to make sure that they got across, I got across the content that, Bible, that God had laid on my heart for them that particular night. And so I'm always encouraged to see how God changes them and how God changes me through that process. You know, sometimes when you think uh, you didn't get what the teacher taught, you might think you have a bad teacher. You might think, uh, I, I can't do this stuff. This stuff's too hard. Or maybe you just go like, I'm not going to do that. You know, some, sometimes. Uh, but when you master change in your life, 
when you get to that place where you discover change is a good and positive thing, then you're going to have a right attitude for life. You see, most change in life is achievable. And we can do that as people of God. And God has some good changes ahead for us. Now, the word for change in the Bible, anybody know what it is? If you were here in the first service, you should. What is it? Repentance. That's it. He got it. Boy, extra candy bar on Wednesday night. Um, <laughs> the, the, the word is repentance. Now, often when we think about the word of repentance, we get lugubrious. Everybody know what that is? Lugubrious. We get like sad and mournful. Like to repent, you have to be sad. But in the, in the Bible, the idea of repentance is to move on to something better. So on your outline there this morning, repentance means to change your mind and act differently. So when God brings things into your heart, into your mind, whether you're reading the Bible or praying or connect, connecting with another believer, that repentance is an opportunity for us to change and to act differently. And we act differently, we make progress toward being more Christ-like. And that's my motivation for change in my life, is to become more Christ-like. Last Sunday, we spent uh, the week with our oldest son, who teaches at uh, the Navy School of War Surface Warfare, and we got to go to his church. And it was fun to go to a different church because we saw some new and some fresh things. I said, we got to bring that change back to Hillcrest. I shared those with Pastor Mark. We're going to be doing some of those things. But it, it, it was change. It was repentance. It wasn't out of lugubrious, but it was out of happiness. It was out of, hey, they did that really well. We could do that too and make, keep, keep things fresh and interesting and vital, and viable here. So I want us to understand that when we embrace change, when we embrace godly repentance, it leads to better living. That's on your outline there. Embracing godly repentance lives to, leads to better living. You see, when I'm reading the Bible, and I get a little tweak from God, a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. It says, Jeff, that's, that's something... That, that's, that's a word for you today. I don't, I don't let that beat me up. I let that go like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking a word to me so that I know how to become more like your son. We recently completed 21 days of prayer. That was a, that was a positive change. I don't know how many of you joined in on that, but what a great opportunity it was to, to come here and pray with others and hear God speak. And that's what happens in chapter 11 today as we're going to look at it in the Bible. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to learn more about repentance and how God wants us to change. You see, the, the people in this particular passage, they weren't open to change. And we can learn from that lesson. So if you're in Luke chapter 11, let's start with verse 1 because here Jesus is with his disciples and they ask him, hey Lord, teach us how to pray. And he does. And then he gives them a couple of sayings there that helps them to understand that we need to be persistent in prayer. We need to seek God out. We need to knock on the door. But also, he lets them know, you know, when you pray, when you come to God, he's a good father. He gives you things better than what you think you need. It's an awesome, awesome text there. But as he's doing that, as we move down into the passage, down into verse 14 now, a crowd has begun to gather around with the disciples to hear what Jesus has to say. And Jesus is doing some good things. Some good things, but look at how the crowd reacts. Verse 14, would you be there with me? Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. And when the demon left the man, uh, left the man who had been, uh, been mute, spoke, the crowd was amazed. I want you to see that. The crowd, the crowd, the people around, they were amazed. And then here's for my English teacher, but that adversative conjunction, you see it there? Everybody say but. Ready? But. But. Look what happens. But. Some of them said it's by Beelzebub, the prince of demons that he's driving out demons. Already we can see there are people that are against Jesus. Now Jesus is headed the last time toward Jerusalem. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they're not happy with who he is because he's challenging them all the time. He's showing their, their hypocrisy. He's, he's leading them to what they need to do better, but they're not getting it. 
They're just providing more and more tension between them. And so what, some in the crowd say, he's doing this by Satan. And then look what it says in verse 16. Others. He's being opposed on multiple sides and multiple fronts. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Their heart just isn't in the right place. They just aren't going to get it. And so he comes across with some pretty harsh words for them because he hasn't gotten across to them yet. And he wants to see them change. He wants to see them repent. And he, and he realizes that this crowd is against him. So Jesus, it says in verse 17, says, He knew their thoughts and said to them, A kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. We know that, don't we? There's so many divorced families in this world. We see how that division happens. So he uses a very, a very common illustration to understand that. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? The answer is it can't. It can't. But these people that were accusing of him of being of Satan or testing him, they can't hear it. They don't get it. And then he says, I say this because you claim I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Hmm. New thought almost here. Now, and you can feel the rebuke coming. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do you followers drive them out? Gotcha. Gotcha. So then, they will be your judges, the people that were doing good. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you, and we all know it has. He drove them out by the finger of it wasn't by Beelzebub. And the kingdom of God is present here now, and it will be in the future. We use this term in seminary called already but not yet. It's not perfect yet. We're not in heaven yet, but it's already. We can already experience the fullness of God. And so he goes to tell them in verse 21 a little illustration here. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house and his own possessions are safe, but when someone stronger attacks, and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. He's saying, hey, I'm stronger. Look at I've got the words. I've got the advice that you need. Would you please listen? Verse 23. And he says this. And they get it, what he's saying now. He who is not with me is against me. And you can feel the tension rise between him and the religious leaders of the day. And he who does not gather with me scatters. That was almost like a slap in the face. Verse 24. When, the evil spirits, when, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest. And now he's talking about the evil spirit he cast out earlier. And he does not find it. Then he says, I will return to the house I left. When it, when it arrives, it will find the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than the first, than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. Now, so if you hear this through Matthew, the way Matthew applies it, it's applied kind of singularly, if you remember in that that when, when evil spirits are cast out of us, we need to replace that with Jesus' spirit. Here, some of the commentators thought this belongs to the nation of Israel. Here's Jesus, he's coming in and he's cleaning house, and when he's all done with that, it's going to be even worse in Israel. And it kind of comes to be that way. Verse 27, And Jesus was saying these things, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed! is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And he replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And that's what I was sharing with you earlier. If you hear the word of God, if you sense the change coming, if you find the repentance that's needed, guess what happens? You're blessed. 
you find a greater thing happening and coming. And so he encourages these people, look at repentance is a good thing. Blessing comes from that. Now I want to dig in here, verse 29. Since they've been challenging him to do miracles, he says this, as the crowd increased in size, so first it started out with disciples, then some more came along, now the crowd is increasing in size. Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. Probably most of us wouldn't want to hear that, would they? This is a wicked generation. It asks for miraculous signs, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Now, they would have known the story, for Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Remember what Jonah did? He preached repentance to the Ninevites. Also, will the Son of Man be to this generation a sign of repentance? The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus is saying to them, look at, look at, if you think Solomon was wise and there were people that came from all over the world to hear his wisdom, here's mine and you're missing it. You're missing it. Take note of it. Look what's happening. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented, the Ninevites repented, at the preaching of Jonah. And now one is greater than Jonah is here. He said, don't you get it? You need to repent. Now he goes through a, a little illustration of a lamp. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come may see the light. Now that's what you and I are. We're lights to the world. Listen to what he says to us here. Your eye, the things that you see, is a lamp to your body. When your eyes are good, when your eyes see a good thing, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are bad, when they see bad things, your body is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be completely lighted as when a, a, the light of a lamp shines on you. Now, if you're a computer programmer, you know this expression very well. Garbage in? Yeah, let's do it again. Garbage in? That's what happens in life. He's saying, look it, with your eyes, you need to understand. If you put garbage in your eyes, that's going to become darkness in you. So rather what you need to do is fill your eyes with good things, and then good things will come out. Then you'll be that kind of witness that he says in verse 30, 33. You'll be that light that shines to the world. That's what he was calling the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the crowd around them to be, to be a light. That's what he's calling you and I to do today, to be that light. How do you get to be that light? By filling your eyes with good things and avoiding the bad things. Now he gets pretty harsh. He gets down to business. Six woes. Let me run through those as quickly as I can here. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat. Not where you'd expect Jesus to go, but he knew the challenge that was ahead and he, he knew that they were going to be critical of him. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Now, this is the legalism that's happening here. So they're looking for something to pick, pick on Jesus for. They found it. He didn't wash his hands. Okay, here we go. Then the Lord said to him, Now, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Wow. Wow. If I went to somebody's house and said to them, you're greedy and wicked, that probably wouldn't be received too well. But he knows what he's facing and he knows what needs to happen here. And so he says to them, you foolish people, I wouldn't do that at dinner neither, did, did the one who made the outside also make the inside? But give what is inside the dish, it, you know, metaphorically them, to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Now the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they all love their money. And they weren't taking care of the poor. And he was saying, look it, you like status. You like symbolism. But what about the poor? See, Jesus is about the poor. He's about the underdogs. He's about helping them. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, they should have gotten it. They didn't. 
Okay. Verse 42. Woe to you Pharisees because you give a tenth of your mint and rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So he's saying, hey, great, you're tithing. Nice. Nice job. More important. More important is justice. Do not take advantage of the poor. That's what they were doing. They didn't like them. They didn't like him to say that. But they were taking that. And then, look at They were doing the list of things that were right to do, not because they were expressing their love for God, but they were hoping other people would affirm them. They were looking for the affirmation. They weren't pointing it to God. And Jesus says, whoa. Tithing good. Not bad. Guy's got that down. But what about justice? What about loving me? Verse 43, Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and the greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. Now, you have to know a little something about the Jewish tradition there. They, they were very serious about how they buried people and how they marked the graves off. And he was saying to them, Look at you guys, you're the worst of the worst. People don't even know. You exist. It's just like walking over an unmarked grave. Wow. I love verse 45. One of the experts of the law, some of your Bibles probably say scribes. We'd call them the lawyers of the day. Answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Yes. <laughs> yes. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. In other words, you're given lots of tasks and reasons and things to do and this is the way you do the right thing, but you don't help anybody to do that. You just let them struggle with that. That's bad. 47, woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets and your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approved what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. They didn't get the message yet. That's what he's saying to them. Look at you, scribes. You, you're, you're the people that write the Bible. You're the people that should know all this stuff. You should have, you should have seen how your forefathers did it badly. You, don't, you haven't gotten it yet. Because you're building tombs for them. And he says, because of, this, God, because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send. Now, I want you to see future tense here. I will send, because this is what happens afterwards. I will send to them prophets and apostles, some of them whom they will kill and others they will persecute. That's what happened to the disciples. That's what happened to many disciples. That's what happened to the apostles. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altars and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. And then he goes on. Woe to you experts of the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who are entering. You see, the key, to, the key is to love God, not the list of things to do. They were in love with the list of things to do. And then... then you see in verse 53, when Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him. How? Fiercely. Wasn't bad enough. Now, fiercely. Let me try to wrap this up. Got some writing to do now on your paper. Okay, you ready? First thing. Oh, I wanted to do this. When, with pastor, you do one, two, three, and you say, so I'm going to do three, two, one, and I want you to say, there you go. Okay, three, two, one. There, same difference, but we just thought we'd have some fun with that this morning. Okay, embrace change. And you can write repentance after that. Embrace godly change. God brings things into your life that need changing all the time. I know that. I have a wife. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, when you see things, when you see your children do some things that you weren't so proud of, oh boy, that, that triggers some things too. When God nudges you for change, whether it's in prayer or whether it's through another believer or whether it's through reading his word, you know what? When God shows you a better way, run to it. Don't delay. Get there 
quickly. You see, the, the Ninevites, they got it. When Jonah came, and we don't want to talk about Jonah at this point, but Jonah came and said, repent. The people there repented, and what did they get? They got better life. They were going to get wiped out. They got better life because they repented. They made the change that they needed to make. And in today's passage, the, the leaders of the religious leaders of the day, they just missed it. And the consequence for them was going to be the, similar to the judgment that was facing the Ninevites. So godly change leads to a better life. Now, this month at Outbound with the Youth Ministry, we're taking a look at marriage. And one of the contrasts that I'm trying to develop with them is there's the way our culture does marriage, and there was the way the Bible does marriage. Our culture sees marriage as a form of recreation. And what can I get out of this relationship? And God sees marriage as an act of intimacy and how to sacrifice for the other person. Those are radically different things. And I want to I lead our youth to the place where they're seeing that God's plan leads to better. They already see how the way our culture deals with marriage and the things negatively that come out of that. And so I'm, I'm pointing them in the direction. Change the way you think. Don't think like our culture thinks. Think like, think like God has for you because it's a wonderful thing. And just as a digress, if, you have, if, you, if you're a parent here with a teenager, I want you to know that you're blessed. I have never worked with such a dedicated group of adults who love your teen. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing to see them. They are an incredible group of, an adult, of adults. Okay, next thing. Be an example to others. Be a light to others. I, I, entitle, I love this. I put the title this morning. Anybody pick it up on the sermon? Are you a flashlight or a flash dark? Think about that a minute. Are you a flashlight or a flash dark? Do you create influence in your life so that you're a positive influence, you're shining the truth on other people, or is the way that you behave darkening other people's lives? Are you a flashlight or a flash dark? You see, in the passage here, it calls us to be the flashlight. In other words, we do things differently from the culture. We do things the way that Bible encourages us to do things. And when you do that, there's a special biblical word for it. It's called holiness. Holiness. We do it separate from the way the world does. And so I wrote down there, holiness is doing life God's way, the right way. I almost wept. Funny thing to do in a locker room. This, this week, um, I, I get to the Y about uh, between 5.15, 5.30, and and as I was uh, getting changed to go up to swim, a man came in and he said, you, are you that pastor up at Hillcrest? And I said, I'm, I'm one of three. I said, why do you ask? And he said, you have some amazing families there. My, my, my children have benefited so much, so much from the Benson family. They brought them to Awana my kids have benefited so much. You know what? I live down the road from a family. That I think they go to your church. They're called the Andersons. And they're such a wonderful family. And I'll tell you, for me as a pastor to be up here and say, this, this, is, this is a church that shines their light. This is a church that leaves a positive influence in our community. I and mean, that just makes me want to weep. And we went to our first church in South Dakota. It was a tough place. Little town. They notice any time a new person comes into town, and so when they saw me, said, who are you? And I said, I'm the pastor up at First Baptist, and their response was, oh, that church. Ouch. But here I am in, in, in a locker room in the Y, and here's a person who says, you have been a light to this community. Wow. And you are. You are. Keep being that light. Another, it, it must be a, a, a week for locker room stories. I don't know. So I'm standing, and I'm sorry to say this, but I'm standing in the shower. This 
so just erase that from your mind for a minute. Uh, I'm standing in the shower, and, this, and a city councilman comes in and says, Pastor Jeff, will you pray for me? What do pastors do? They pray. Okay, I said, okay. And um, <clears throat> so what's going on? What do you want me to pray about? And, and he told me what he wanted me to pray about, and I said, okay. I came over to put my hand on his shoulder. He said, you've got to put a towel on. <laughs> I'm naked and unashamed. That's the way it was in the Garden of Eden. No, um, he said, <laughs> said, really? Yes, you have to put a towel on. So I did and prayed. But here, here you know, you can be a light to this world, and, and we're a church that's making a difference in this community. We're being a light. We're challenging. We're challenging people. We're living the testimony. We've repented. We've made the change. Many of us had, and I just want to encourage you to do that even, even more and more. Let's look at the last one here. Correct motives. See, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes or the lawyers in this passage, they were hypocrites. They were just doing what they were doing so that they could get the glory instead of pointing the glory to God. And we always have to check our motives. I, I, I go to Jefferson on Thursday to talk to 5th and 6th graders. How many of you like to, I'd like to be in a room of 40 5th graders? You know, probably not many of us, but... Um, I do that because I love God and these little people need God. Most of them don't have a whole father and a mother. And my motivation is to say, not, not look at Jeff, but look at God. Look what God has done for you. Look what God has done for you. Look what God has done for you. And Dan Swenson goes there with me and that's all we do is just say, look at what God has done for you. Look what God has done for you. We just want to be a light. Just want to be a light in the community. It, it would fall flat if it was about me. We just want it to be about God. So check your motivation. Let me, let me wrap it up here for us this morning. Jesus' followers are more than spiritual consumers. They are spiritual contributors. Did you write that down? You're a spiritual contributor. See, that, that's you being the light in this world. And so if I ask the question, how can, can I, there's two questions here. How can I personally become a light to others? That's what I want you to ask as you leave today. How can I personally become a light to others? And how can Hillcrest, as a church, become a light to others? Let me do it first for personally. I don't know what God is speaking to you right now or saying to you right now. But I know one of the things that God is saying to me, stop being so busy. Stop being so busy. That's a change. I hear it. I like being busy. I like doing, but I can hear him saying, you need to repent. Stop being so busy. What's God saying to you? That's the ch one of the challenges from today's message. What is God saying to you? What, what does he need to change? I, I, I'm doing good things, but there's better things that he has for me, okay? So stop, stop being so busy. It's not unusual for me to put 72 hours in in a week, okay? And he's saying stop. But how can we be the light as a church? One of the challenges that I think for us is as we move from a church for about 250 to, to 300, there's a, there's a barrier there that church growth people talk about. And it's the way you do church has to change because you're no longer a small church, you're now growing to being a medium-sized church. In a small church, you can make a decisions as a congregation. And, and many car congregations are styled after what our government does. You know, congregational government. How well does our government function? Not well. And so churches get to 250, 300, and they stop and they shrink again because they don't learn to change with the size of the church they are. And we need to do that. We need to do church just a little bit differently than we have done before. It's not about maintaining something. It's about visioning something greater for God's kingdom. And I wanted to let you know that we have a senior pastor who has a great vision for this church. Okay? Grab onto that vision. I have, and I want you to, too. And we see things. These are visioning kind of things. Take this out of your bulletin this morning, this women's retreat thing, would you? I'm, I'm living up to your, your statement, Pastor Mark. I'm going long. 
this is an opportunity for you to be a light, women. Here, here's a retreat. It's not too far away. It's not very expensive. And for you to invite someone, a woman who you know is struggling, who could use some encouragement, who could be around other women of faith and discover the truth for themselves. We can be a light as a church as well. And I'm looking forward to being that light. Such a blessing to be a pastor here. Think of this as an individually. God gave you a fingerprint that no one else has so that you can leave an imprint that no one else can. Okay? He's working in your life. He wants to make a difference. I hope I've been an encouragement to you this morning. Because I want you to ask the question, are you a flashlight or a flash dark? It's so much fun to be a flashlight. And we all can be, by God's Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time with my church family. What a powerful passage. And our Lord faced all that opposition just for, just for us. Just so that we could see the light. And we could be changed by the light. Boy, thank you for being so gracious to us. I pray that you would challenge us to think about how we could be changing for the better, because you have better things for us, both individually and as a church. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.